Good morning. We're live this morning, Tuesday morning, 1030 a.m. And I am live with Frieda Milhouse Jones. She's a mom and a doctor who's going to share her family's story with eating disorder, parenting a teen with eating disorder. Before we get to her story, and thank you for joining us, Frida. Thank you very much. Thank you. Before we get to her story, though, I want to remind you that we're live on Tuesday. If you are watching us any other day, any other time, not 1030 a.m. Eastern time, then you are watching a replay. Frida will be here to address your comments and questions if you're live, but if you're not live, she won't be here. But please feel free to dialogue with other people in the comment section. We'd love to hear from you and see that action. Now, some of you may think that Frida's name sounds familiar, and it should because she wrote an article for us a few months ago that just did really well. And I say went viral, but if you ask my team, my numbers don't, in, don't indicate viral. But, you know, <laughs> I don't agree with him. I disagree. It went viral. So we asked her to join us live and share her story so that you could hear from her directly. Thank you for joining us, Frida. I really appreciate you spending time with us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be on your show. Okay, why don't we start with, tell us just a little bit about yourself, your family and the work that you do. Well, I am actually a practicing internist here in Atlanta, uh, primarily in outpatient internal medicine. Uh, I'm married to a wonderful husband, Terrence, and have two girls. Uh, and I guess as far as other things about myself, I enjoy yoga. That's kind of how I keep myself sane. Uh, I love to read and I love to dance. And oh. so these are a few things about me. Oh, yeah, those are good things. Minor in, in college, but you know, the medical school thing kind of took the forefront. So I had to put dance on, in the back seat for a while. Or actually, That's a whole different conversation. How you do pursue your passions and, and your vocation and they can be completely different. Correct. That's a, that's a future conversation. But for now, we're talking about eating disorders. So can you tell us what is an eating disorder? Well, eating disorders are complex. Um, they oftentimes start with uh, just patterns of disordered eating. So um, and there are restrictive patterns or patterns where patients or uh, individuals may overeat. Um, it often can start as a method to uh, regulate emotions, but then based on other factors, be it genetics or environment, it can then spiral into a full-fledged disorder, which um, it, it can look any one of a, a number of ways. We're probably um, most used to seeing uh, disorders such as anorexia nervosa, which is a disorder um, which where patients are usually underweight um, and sometimes severely underweight. Uh, there are disorders such as uh, bulimia where patients may binge eat. So eating um, large amounts or more than what a traditional person uh, may eat within a certain amount of time. And then it's usually followed by some type of purging, be it uh, vomiting, um, laxatives, or excessive exercise. So there's like, there's a need once the patient binge eats to then um, cancel out the, the binge in some form. And then there, there uh, I guess these are the three most common ones. Binge mm -hmm. eating disorder is actually extremely common where patients binge eat um, and they may have multiple episodes of binge eating per week, but they do not purge. And so um, that's a, another entity and there's some other subtypes, but uh, our experience primarily uh, involves anorexia um, with a little bit of uh, bulimia, actually. Okay. Um, it, Jessica, our wonderful Jessica, who's behind the scenes, is going to put up some articles and pieces that tell about eating disorder symptoms and different types. So you can peruse those at your convenience. Mm -hmm. For now, we're going to go straight into the Jones family story. And first, I want to thank your daughters and your husband for allowing you to share your story with us. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, your whole family. And why don't you tell us your story about with eating disorder in your family? Yes. Um, you know, I kind of want to piggyback on that because I really had a long uh, conversation with my daughter uh, prior to doing this live broadcast and just asking, like, what kind of things are off limits? And she I asked her several times and she said to me, you know, mom, they're just 
I really can't think of anything, you know. Um, this is my story and it's made me who I am and I, I have nothing to be ashamed of. And there are a lot of people out there that are hurting. So um, she was also um, enthusiastic for me to uh, share her story or our story so that we may help other people. So I think that I'll, I'll start back in, uh, my daughter is now in high school, mm -hmm. um, but our difficulty started in middle school. And I remember um, I would always like hear stories from parents in the exam rooms about uh, any one of a number of different uh, tumultuous conditions at home or distress, mm -hmm. distressing mental health conditions. And I kept thinking, wow, I hope that doesn't happen to us. Mm -hmm. uh, and then lo and behold, um, around seventh grade, my daughter started having some um, very dark thoughts. And she came to me with those thoughts. And um, being the healthcare professional that I am, I took them very seriously. And so we started with uh, psychotherapy, um, then got referred to a psychiatrist. Uh, we were placed on medications and just never quite seemed to make headway. You know, um, we would start new medicines and she would say, oh, this is making me worse. It's making me suicidal. So then we would change medications. And it was just this nonstop, like, merry-go-round, it seemed like, until things finally um, spiraled out of control. And we ended up having a partial hospital, um, a partial hospital program admission. Um, things got a little bit better. We established care with a psychotherapist that she's still currently with. But there was always over the years going into early high school, there was just always this sense that we were missing something. You know, we were very compliant with all of the um, individual therapy uh, groups, like classes that she would attend. Um, she had our psychiatrist. We were extraordinarily compliant, but things just never seemed to progress. And then um, you know, God has jokes sometimes because I have a colleague that is actually an internist that will be seeing patients primarily. She's leaving um, traditional private practice to start a uh, primarily eating disorder practice. And she had set up a panel interview of different dietitians and therapists and um, psychiatrists to teach our practice about treatment of eating disorders and just how it presents, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so I really didn't, I, I was raining the day. I really did not feel like going. I already RSVP'd yes. And I was like, oh, I can't let her down. She's worked so hard in order to put this together. So I went and I remember thinking, um, listening to all this, there was one African-American psychotherapist and I remember raising my hand and saying, yeah, you know, we really just don't see this that much in my primarily African-American patient base. And she promptly corrected me like, oh, no, <laughs> there's there's plenty of disordered eating or eating disorders in African-Americans. Um, and she was like, you know, I may see more binge eating disorder, but we still see anorexia, bulimia and, and the the other uh, disorders. And and I remember thinking like, Hmm. I, I mean, I've been in practice for a while. I really just don't see that. I kind of like listened, but like, yeah, whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. And then lo and behold, my daughter um, ended up having a syncopal episode or passing out episode at home. And when that happened, it was like, ding, 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 ding. Remembered the panel that I had just attended like several months prior and I asked her, like, you know, have you been vomiting or and she was like, yes. And she she had admitted it. And I, I was just floored. I was like, how have I been missing this all of this time? Mm -hmm. um, and so we then um, kind of made the transition to recognizing and digging a little bit deeper that it wasn't just vomiting. I could then look back at other uh, signs that we missed, such as, uh, you know, start wearing baggy clothes. Uh, she would make uh, excuses as to why she couldn't down, come down to eat for dinner. Like, you know, uh, you know, it's like, hey, come down to eat. 
oh, I, I'm working on some homework. I'll, I'll eat later. Uh, you know, there were things that all of a sudden that I knew that she used to love and her dietician caused this uh, terminal pickiness where it was just like, I don't like that anymore. I don't like that anymore. Just kind of like pick, 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 pick until there was like hardly anything left um, that she would eat. And we would see that she would eat at times. Like, so she would get up and make like a ton of pancakes. And we just thought that, oh, wow, she's just kind of a carbaholic. She just loves to eat carbs. But what would happen is, is that when patients restrict for a while, they're actually, they become very hungry and they're usually craving glucose, you know, carbohydrates for energy. So we would see times when she would eat and then just kind of not just, Again, based on my own implicit bias that I'd heard that, you know, oh, black people don't get eating disorders or that's just like rich, affluent um, Caucasian women that get that. And I just ignored a ton of signs and symptoms. And so um, another just adding on another thing is that we would like sometimes go to Chick-fil-A, let's say, and she would get like a Chick-fil-A sandwich or what have you, but come to find out there are all of these internal food rules that she had. So I can eat if it was right before dance class, where then I could like exercise and negate um, the, the calories. Mm -hmm. So um, all of these things started, you know, putting, coming together and realizing, okay, this is truly an eating disorder. Um, interestingly, one of the uh, criteria that used to be, uh, that used to be, I think, part of the psychiatric uh, conditions that you had to meet for anorexia is that it was losing your menses. But she, mm -hmm. never, she started menarche, she had her cycles. And so again, the doctor in me is like, well, she's had a period, she's, you know, hasn't fallen off the growth curve, like, how could this be? Okay, so fast forward, we finally realized that this is a problem and it's a pandemic. And, mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. I don't, I'm sure that many of you have seen the amount of eating disorder hospitalizations, the amount of eating disorders that have surfaced out of the pandemic, just been extraordinary. So I spent so much time trying to call and find an eating disorder therapist that could take her on. And we were placed on multiple wait lists. And in that time, she just spiraled, spiraled, spiraled. We then um, had to be admitted for an acute hospitalization. And from that, we were able to get into another uh, partial hospitalization program to start eating disorder treatment. And that has been a lifesaver. It's literally saved my daughter's life. We're so happy she's in that program. What happens in the program? What do they do for parents who may be seeking this type of help? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, you know, in anorexia in particular, you know, met, uh, the medicine, the treatment is food. And so there is a lot of structured um, meals, um, both like breakfast, morning snack, afternoon, uh, I'm sorry, lunch, afternoon snack, dinner. And in the program, you're usually responsible for managing the family kind of manages one of those meals and then they go into the, the, the treatment from let's say 11 to seven mm -hmm. we'll have lunch there and snacks there. And it's supervised there with their peers that are in treatment. And it's usually, at least for my child, it was a very um, nurturing supportive environment. Uh, the other clients, um, at the time that she was there, there were a lot of young girls and they just coach each other on and give each other hugs um, whenever they, you know, complete a meal or even halfway complete a meal because there's such, um, uh, for anorexia in particular, I mean, there's an intense, they're usually restricting enough so that they're underweight. Um, there is an intense fear of gaining weight and usually some body kind of um, perception issues. So when you've gone for a very long time where you haven't eaten, you know, pay, or people that don't understand eating disorders will say, why don't they just eat? Well, the body has literally um, tried to 
conserve energy. So it's really just trying to protect the brain and, and like the heart and other things. So the gut actually gets very sluggish and lazy. There's like uh, from chronic malnutrition. So there's a condition called gastroparesis that can happen where the, the stomach is just hasn't been used to working very well. So um, you have to slowly eat a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. And they'll really actually feel very, very bad, nauseated, sick when they first start reading. But you just have to keep pushing through the discomfort in a very... Right. Go ahead. No, I'm thinking it's like rebuilding a muscle, right? If you mm -hmm. haven't used a muscle, yes. Correct, correct. So, um, you know, the first meal, you might be able to only eat half of it, and then you have to supplement that with some type of oral supplement, like a boost um, drink or what have you, until finally, once, once the body starts to get weight restored, the intestines can start to work again. And all of a sudden, a lot of patients with anorexia, they'll complain of constipation and things of that nature. And then all of a sudden, oh, now finally they can, because everything's working again, it's used to digesting food and moving. Now they can have bowel movements and all of those things. So it's extraordinary what this does to the body and the mind. Now, eating disorders, I read, they develop often in adolescence or young adulthood, um, although they can develop during other times. Do we know why so many people develop these disordered eatings during this time period, this early, this adolescent period? Gosh, you know, I was talking with a um, psychiatrist yesterday, and there are just so many factors. Um, mm -hmm. it, there's actually some research that there may be some genes that um, predispose patients to eating disorders, because you'll look in clusters of families and see that there may be um, other family members that suffered from an eating disorder. Um, the environment is very important. Uh, so if there is a very, I don't know, like in, in different families, there's just lots of different issues that can occur. And so for a person where restricting calories works to decrease their anxiety and help them feel like they're more in control when things are out of control. If they're the kind of person where that clicks and that works, then it's very easy for that to just kind of go into this uh, loop. I guess I just got like a, a, a neural loop where that just continues to spiral. So, and then the, uh, this, this pandemic has been an entirely, uh, it's been enormous stress and traumatic for many people. So they had access to food and then that can kind of spiral. So there's act, so there's a connection between anxiety and an eating disorder. Um, and you mentioned that you were treating your daughter first for, was it anxiety issues that you were treating before you discovered the eating disorder? And depression. And depression. Uh, anxiety and depression. And so, um, one of the things I want to highlight in our case is that we were chasing the anxiety and depression and mostly depression at the time in middle school. And it, she was not improving. And the reason that she was not improving is that there was this underlying eating disorder. And so the brain um, needs food. There is an entity in anor anorexia called starved brain, which um, if you can think of like an animal like a dog like that's starving on the street how they can like you know they can be aggressive and irritable and um hyper vigilant um that's literally kind of how a star brain um the person with star brain anorexia feels they're like very um they can be very moody they can be very irritable they can be very rigid in their thinking mm -hmm. um there is a book that i read like i'm gonna go i have it right here called sick enough by dr Jennifer Gaudiani, mm -hmm. uh, which was so helpful to me because um, the they I think in this book she commented that there was a study where they looked at maybe healthy young men and gave them these higher calorie diets like up to three thousand calories a day and then um, in the second half of the study reduced their caloric intake and made them do a lot of heavy labor. And what they found in many of these otherwise normal subjects is that they became very depressed, 
Um, some of them started to self-harm. Uh, there was just, it just really highlights how important it is for the brain to have like nutrition because it just does not work correctly mm -hmm. when it's starving and they won't. Be. So um, for my child in particular, uh, I, she had her mood disorders that are independent of themselves, but they were chronically like that she could not recover and get better because this eating disorder was um, in the background. And now that she has been nutritionally rehabilitated, her brain is working normally. We've got like our, our, our girl back, you know, like our wonderful girl. It's just so beautiful to watch. She's, she's extraordinary. That's an important note for people to remember that when you're dealing with an eating disorder, you can starve the brain, which is going to change the person's personality. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. all of these things come into play. And if this is happening into your home, in your home, hold on, because there is hope. We have a lot of resources here. Um, Dr. Jones has shared some. She's going to share some more. I have a question about your family. You say we because this is the whole family, but how did it affect you? You have another daughter and mm -hmm. there's you and your husband. How did it affect your whole family? Wow. Well, uh, the second part of this is that we did, uh, you know, we had organized or uh, partial hospital um, treatment uh, mm -hmm. for her eating disorder initially, but the mainstay or the modality that's been shown to be the most helpful for adolescents for treating eating disorders is called family-based therapy, um, mm -hmm. also known as the Maudsley approach, which mm -hmm. I was reading started from, the name came from the developers that were at a hospital called Maudsley Hospital in um, England. Mm -hmm. So there are basically three phases to uh, family-based therapy or what's called FBT. So we think of it as the, there's like the, toddler phase or baby phase where um, it's like, hey, you are the parent, you know how to feed your child. You basically take over all the meals. So mm -hmm. have a schedule, like it's breakfast, mid-morning snack, lunch, afternoon snack, dinner, bedtime snack. Um, there's meetings like with a therapist for the entire family because eating disorders are a, the entire family has to be involved for the success of the patient and so, or my daughter in this case. So we had to learn how to coach um, her at the dinner table, my husband, myself, uh, my daughter, my other daughter just kind of learned to, she's younger, so she just kind of learned to be in the mix and, and be respectful. Mm -hmm. There are games that you play at the dinner table to re uh, reduce the anxiety around eating meals. Um, mm -hmm. It encompasses the entire family and in order to um, be successful. Everybody has to be in, all in. And uh, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was, it was extraordinarily stressful. Not only that, but just like making sure that you, you know, you have to cook and prepare and eat or, or watch her eat and supervise and coach and sometimes fight. I mean, literally we would like kind of go toe to toe, like you've got to eat this. And she would um, be very, very resistant. Um, so in that it's, it's taught, um, me a lot about myself. It's, uh, in order to make it through, it's made my relationship with my husband stronger and we've had to be in so much family therapy that I think as a unit, we just work so much better t together because we've had to, in order to mm -hmm. help save her life. And how's she doing now? Amazing. Yeah. Just amazing. I am just so extraordinarily proud of her. Uh, so as I mentioned in the three phases of FBT, the first phase is the taller phase where you basically take over all the meals. The second phase, they um, liken it to an adolescent phase where they take over some of their choices of meals, but you still have meals that you um, supervise or I don't want to say administer, but you, that you're still, you're still have partial control over the meals. And then the third phase is like the adult phase where they uh, take over their eating independently on their own. So she's in the third phase now. So she's just doing what she needs to do. And, um, you know, we still see our dietitian monthly and making sure that she's stable 
and she's just doing great. So extremely proud of her. And will this be a lifelong struggle for her or is there an end point or? Well, from what I understand, recovery is usually about full recovery is like five to seven years. So I think after that time period, then you're pretty much in the clear. But up until then, we'll still be just following whatever the plans uh, are for our, that our therapists kind of, the guidelines that they set mm -hmm. forth uh, and her dietitian as well. So it's a, it's a long road, obviously. It's, it's uh, when it works for that person to help relieve their anxiety or stress or depression or make them feel more in control. Um, it's like an old friend. So as disordered as it is, it's, it's easy to kind of go back to it when times are rough. And so I won't say that we're in the clear, but uh, we are all working together to make sure that we keep moving in the right direction. Okay. So when you started your story, I want to say Dee Walker says hi, everybody. And we say hi. And I'm hi. pointing that out because if you have a comment or question, please put it in the comment section so that we can address that, especially directly to Frida. She was happy to address that. At the beginning of your story, you said that you realized your daughter had an eating disorder when she passed out. Mm -hmm. What advice do you give to parents who either suspect that this is an issue or like you are confronted with it in an extreme circumstance like that? What is the next step? First, I would say for anyone that just don't assume, always ask, get nosy, mm -hmm. ask questions to your child. If you start to see things that you're just questioning even a little bit, you know, um, take it seriously. A lot of people, they, they don't take eating disorder seriously and it needs professional help in order to get past it correctly and healthily. So you can first start with reaching out to your pediatrician. Uh, you can meet with a psychiatrist if you know that there's other mental health orders that you disorders that you've already are concerned about, both depressive symptoms, you know, or anxiety related symptoms. But the most important thing is to reach out and get help. Okay. Okay. Um, what else do we need to know um, so that we can support our teams through the process? You, you've, you've, as you say, you still have a ways to go, but you've come through some critical parts of this process, what do we need to know so that we can best support our teens? What do you need to know in regards to um, which, I mean, there's so much to. Let's say what do, let's say that our teen is in the beginning of a reco of recovery. What, how can we best support them? I would just say just to be loving and open and understanding, mm -hmm. um, you know, there, there's no one path to recovery. It's like a zigzag line, you know, very commonly. And I think the biggest thing is just to be like, just just to, to show up, just to show up for your child and to be there to let them know that they're not alone, that you're going to be there with them the entire step of the way and that you're not going to always get things right and that you're learning and you're doing the best that you can and we're in treatment so that we can do better. And so um, that's really it. You know, I, I've learned, it, it's very interesting. And the thing that um, I also want to impress upon everyone is that here I am, I am an internal medicine physician. Like this is supposed to be my jam, right? Mm -hmm. Healthcare, health-related problems are supposed to be my jam. And yet I did not see this in my own home. Like I rationalized away a ton of symptoms and signs because of my own implicit bias and just mis general miseducation about um, eating disorders. So they are a very secretive disease. And if a person wants to, if a patient, person, child wants to hide it from you, they will do a really good job. So your job is to get in there, ask questions, and then follow the, the guidance of the people that are trained to treat this disorder. I mean, there are eating disorder. Th I mentioned the pediatricians and, you know, psychiatrists, and that is one part, but probably the most important part of eating disorder care is the eating disorder therapist. And you will meet with them weekly and they will 
uncover tons and tons of stuff that you probably did not realize was even an issue. Uh, and you just follow their lead and they will lead you on the path of recovery. And the dietitian is also important too. Gosh, there's so many people on the team. It's like, it's usually, there's a psychiatrist, an eating disorder therapist, a dietitian, um, psychiatrist, and then you have just your general medical um, person, like either your pediatrician or an internal medicine physician. It's a, it's a, it's a team, it's a team approach. It's a team approach. You um, mentioned that the pandemic has, of course, made this worse, a lot of things, mental health issues worse, which also makes care more difficult to achieve. You gave us a resource. It's in the comment section, I believe. I, you know, I watch this stuff scroll up as I'm looking for people's individual comments and questions about an online resource for this, that somebody is going into online care. Uh, yeah, so there's, there's one that's already in existence. Um, Equip is like a large... Um, te telemedicine virtual practice for eating disorders that I think mm -hmm. are credentialed on a, a lot of insurance companies. My colleague is leaving to go into um, eating disorder treatment in the Southeast. Her name is Dr. Kara Pepper. Um, so I believe that she's now licensed in North Carolina, South Carolina, uh, Georgia, probably somewhere else. So they're, <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember off the top of yeah. my head. Um, Dr. Carolyn Ross does also a lot of eating disorder treatment. Um, there's tons and tons of, uh, there's, there, there's, there's lots of, of, of ways to access care. Um, unfortunately, I think one of the biggest barriers though are just, it's insurance, you know, insurance mm -hmm. and, um, and just, it's extraordinarily expensive. But many of the um, therapists and dietitians they don't necessarily, they don't bill your insurance on their own. So you have to pay and then submit the claim to your insurance company yourself. And um, so luckily there is one, I think nonprofit that I sent called Project Heal that does have some scholarships and things of that nature for people to access eating disorder care. But that in and of itself is one of the biggest challenges. Um, I think of all of the young people that are out there whose parents are working and um, just trying to make ends meet. And I think of the cost that we've had to incur um, for her care. And I know for many families, it's just not feasible. And so that's one of the things that, that, that needs to change in this country. Thank you for pointing out the resources. We have the links in the comment section and mm -hmm. also the additional difficulty of the cost. And hopefully online will help alleviate, online services will help alleviate some of that. Um, you mentioned, we know that you, any mom, any parent, when they realize that something has gone undetected in their home, feels guilty and awful. Mm -hmm. And you are also a physician. So mm -hmm. you had it coming at you both ways. I don't yes. have to ask how you felt. What I want to ask is, have you forgiven yourself yet? Still a work in progress. I think yes. And I think that I am trying to heal. I'm doing a lot of healing through writing. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that I had to face where was how did I have this African American child that, you know, developed this very rigid perfectionistic disease. And so, which was anorexia. And I had to think like, okay, if environment is part of this you know, where did this come from? And I had to look really inside of myself. I did not have an eating disorder, but I was highly perfection or and still am highly perfectionistic. So had to, I wrote a piece on perfectionism uh, that helped a lot with dealing with, with just my thoughts around that. I'm actively working on that with my own therapist um, and trying to learn how to, to not be so rigid and be a little more self-compassionate. Um, and so the other thing that I'm doing also is just trying to find purpose in helping people, um, especially patients of color, because they're just, you know, when we have our hashtag representation matters, there are, you don't tend to see a lot of African-American faces being very open about their eating disorder journey. So I've, um, I really want to, to make sure that I put a face, you know, a face of color to this. Um, disease because it affects all of us. 
And in some cases, I think I saw a stat on um, National Eating Disorder, NETA, National Eating Disorders Association, that um, African-American teens may are more at risk for a lifetime prevalence of eating disorder, but yet, you know, will be commonly overlooked. You know, the same symptoms and signs may not be recognized as problematic. So I, um, I'm actually writing some children's books. Um, the first one is called Afro, Afro Puffs Held High. That one's in, being illustrated currently. And that is really kind of my own like uh, story, my own childhood uh, adversity story. And then I have some other children's books that I'm working on um, along the mental health realm. So trying to get characters of color and illustration in a way that uh, kids can see that they're not alone. Oh, we're looking forward to seeing those. Those mm -hmm. are going to help us move the discussion along. We're really looking forward to hearing those. We are at the end of our time together. And I always like to ask if there's one thing and only one thing that someone remembers from this important conversation, what should it be? You are not alone. You are not alone. Whatever you are feeling or thinking, um, we're doing in the realm of eating, there's help. Mm -hmm. And there, there are people that are out there that can help you get past this. And so it's just making, or I guess, taking the uh, first steps to reach out for help. Perfect. That's why we like to share the parents' perspective. We talk with a lot of experts, but we like to share the parents' perspective because that really drives in the point, you are not alone. But here's another family that's experiences. If you're experiencing the same, it's okay. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank your family for sharing their story in writing and now live on the air. We appreciate the generosity. I know that it's not easy. Mm -hmm. um, there are resources in the comment section. Please access those if you think that this is something that is happening in your family or if you know, please access those resources. Tomorrow, we will be back at 10.30 a.m. with um, Jen and Sharon, Coffee with Jen and Sharon. So please join us then when they have a topic that they discuss. They're two moms and they discuss all things connected with teens. Tonight, we are continuing our Destination College series. It's a summit. It meets once a week. And we tonight we are discussing, ooh, I believe we are behind the scenes with the application, but I could be wrong. Uh, please register for the Destination College series. All registrants are eligible for our Grand Raffle Prize. The Grand Raffle Prize is an SAT or ACT course by Sylvan Learning. That is a $1,200 value. You don't have to do anything other than register for that. If you are just registering now and we are on week four, don't worry, you will receive the um, replays of the, the recordings of the previous weeks. So you will not have missed them and you can watch it at your own on your own time. And that applies to this week and the future weeks that if you can't quite get on for the live discussion, which I encourage because then you can question our um, experts live, you can have access to the recordings when you register. So please, in the, in the comment section is the registration link, and we will be on tonight with Destination College and tomorrow, Wednesday, with Coffee with Jen and Sharon. Dr. Jones, thank you again. I appreciate your story, and I appreciate all it takes for you to get up in front of us and tell it. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. You're welcome. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>